I'm in New York City. I'm on the west side, midtown, across from the Lincoln Tunnel. So I came across your work through Future States, <laughs> the ITVS online series. So I wanted to talk with you first off about how you got involved in working on a project for the series. It basically, it was it's a grant and it's a commission by ITVS. And so they invited 200 artists to apply. So it was kind of by nomination um, to apply for the series. And then it was really an intensive grant application. And they narrowed it down and there were different rounds. And um, it went down then to, I think, 10 projects. So there were um, 10 filmmakers from around the country that were then selected nationally to make these films, um, you know, that were 15-minute films that dealt in some way with the future and some kind of in impending global issue. The film that you produced is That Which Once Was. Mm -hmm. So for those who have not seen it yet, the way that I describe it is beautifully sad, or sadly beautiful, whichever way you want to look at it. Without giving away the story, talk to me about the issue that, or the futuristic issue that you wanted to address and and how you came up with the idea for this story. The piece is really about environmental refugees. It's projected that, say, in, in 50 years, there are probably going to be 200 to 250 million environmental refugees, and um, that really means people that have been displaced by environmental disaster and are forced to migrate someplace else. Um, so it just seems like it's such a huge problem, and there were, you know, I mean, there even now are constantly floods and earthquakes um, that are that are displacing people and having this huge impact um, on different cultures, different groups. Um, and Haiti had just happened recently. I mean, I actually had been working on the idea before that, but I was thinking particularly how, you know, this kind of um, environmental dis disaster and displacement could impact children you know, and that kind of loss. And so the film really focuses on a boy um, who's eight years old from the Caribbean who has experienced this devastating um, hurricane and he's lost his family and his home and he's been displaced and he ends up in a children's shelter in New York City. And so it's really, you know, his story and the story of a man from the Arctic Circle who's also been displaced by the, you know, ice melting and who finds himself in this new place. And it's, this, it's really the story about this unlikely kind of bond and friendship that develops between these two people who both experience mm -hmm. tremendous loss. And, um, you know, it's kind of like these two people from very different worlds coming together and making a connection that has a, a real impact on their lives. Why tell this story through the eyes, in a way, of this small child? Well, you know, I mean, I've always been, you know, like I said, I was particularly interested in in how this could impact kids because it just seems like that's even, you know, a more sort of serious issue. I had also been influenced really by a recent trip that I had taken to Uganda. I did a feature film, uh, a feature documentary that is actually in circulation now called Where Are You Taking Me? which was a film that was commissioned by the Rotterdam International Film Festival as part of a special series on African cinema. I went to Africa for the first time and I went to Uganda and um, the focus of the film really is on kind of everyday life in Uganda but and so it's kind of a very different depiction of Uganda than you typically see but I did visit a school um, in the north that was um, a school that was for kids impacted by the Civil War and it's a very different representation of this school than you typically see. This school in particular, it was founded, it's called Hope North, and it was founded by this amazing um, artist and activist, um, Sam Okello, who actually had been, he, he and his family had been really impacted by the war, and he founded this school, and one of the central kind of ideas behind the school is using art as a form of therapy. And so dance and music and theater and visual arts are really integrated into the curriculum to kind of help the kids in the healing process. And so that's another dimension in the film, you know, because it's like these kids and you see them and they're doing some art projects and they're different kind of forms of healing and therapy. And so that was another experience that I had recently that really influenced me and I think really impacted the ideas, you know, and the kind of genesis of this project. So in a way, I think the story, at least in that which once was, takes place in 2032. 
Yeah. But it's a timeless story at the same time. Yeah, I really, you know, when you're asked to do something futuristic, I think that the danger is to sort of, you know, really go off on creating little gadgets and everything that often for me don't actually seem very realistic. And so for me, I didn't try to do any of that actually. In some ways, it's almost like a regression in time or it is something that feels timeless where, where things actually feel in a sense a little more antiquated, you know, and that you're dealing with sort of crude things or, you know, um, so I really made no attempt to kind of try to, you know, design anything futuristic. I wanted it to be something that was a sort of timeless story and just focused on the characters and the emotions and the experiences, you know, that they were dealing with. Future States is a series uh, that is exclusively online. You have to change the, the, the style that you have as a filmmaker to suit this format. You know, I didn't really... Um, approach it differently in terms of online distribution. Honestly, I expect for this film to also screen in in very large format. So, for example, it premiered at South by Southwest Film Festival and was projected on an enormous screen and looked, you know, really beautiful because we shot it on the red camera and the, the production value of the film is really high and the aesthetics of the film are really important to me because my work is very visually driven. Whether it's for a smaller screen or a big screen, it's like that's very important to me. So, you know, I think you you have to think a little bit more about things on a smaller screen and in some ways maybe the speed of the film is a little faster than I tend to cut at, you know. I think you are dealing with an audience that is not as likely to be focused and has more distractions. But I didn't in a in a big way kind of reconceive the idea or, you know, the aesthetics of the piece. There's just probably a little more attention to sort of pacing. I'm really interested in a sense of place and storytelling. Mm -hmm. And place certainly is a part of that which once was, certainly a part of um, where are you taking me? And I just wanted to get the sense from you as a storyteller of, of why you think place is such an important part of telling a story. Well, I'm really interested in all of my work of uh, immersing the viewer into an environment. And so that's a really, really important part of my, uh, of my filmmaking. And so just like the sort of visual storytelling, I'm interested in a sensory experience for the viewer and for them to feel like they're really there. And so a lot of times, you know, the color and the sound is really heightened and intensified in my work, so you really have the sense of being there. And so, um, you know, that's the case, like in the, this film, the documentary in Uganda, Where Are You Taking Me? It's really structured so you feel as though you are experiencing that journey and traveling and really kind of just plop there in the, in the middle of Uganda. And there's a certain amount of confusion and disorientation that's part of that experience because that's part of the experience of a foreigner traveling in that place. And this piece, location, was so important as well just in terms of creating, you know, a really interesting uh, environment as far as the children's shelter. And there were a lot of details that were very important to me. And again, the, 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 the production design around that was very influenced by my trip to Uganda and, and, and going to the school and like looking at how the kids, you know, who really did have just like a suitcase of items that they owned, you know, and like the little things that they collected and, you know, little things that they had on the wall and maybe the one or two photographs that they had, you know, that was very influential. And I worked with the production designer, um, Matt Herschel, who was really terrific in kind of thinking about this and trying to create this environment. And we used a church in Brooklyn, in bed -Stuy that uh, was really this amazing location in terms of, you know, the windows and this kind of uh, refuge. And so for me, the location is so important in the environment. It inspires a lot of the ideas and, and really inspires the different possibilities. And a lot of times the work kind of organically grows and develops out of the location. And then the ICE studio, which is the other really important location, I had been working or, or am still working on a, a feature project that is about an ice carver and I had been working in close collaboration with um, Okamoto Studios and um, uh, an ice carver. I mean it's, it's really a business that's run by a family and had done a lot of research there and spent a lot of time and really trying to get a sense of you know the real rhythms of work and a real sense of what's done there. And so that environment, too, is a very special environment and an authentic environment, you know. So both of those places are really important in the piece.
Ice is a medium that is not permanent. What is it about ice carving that, that is attractive to you as a filmmaker? Well, you know, first of all, it offers such amazing visual possibilities because it's so beautiful. And then it takes all of these different forms. And there's so many, you know, on one hand, you know, what was amazing was that the actor, the lead actor, Natar Ungaluk, who is, who is a, you know, a renowned actor, he actually learned the ice carving. And his background is as a sculptor um, in other materials, but he's a nationally, you know, renowned sculptor, and that's what he was before he became an actor. And so he was able to pick up the tools really quickly. I mean, it was amazing. So he actually carved the ice. Those um, are his ice carvings yes. in the film? He, wow. He, there was a little that was done at the end in terms of speeding things up, but I mean, you see him using the chainsaw and using these yeah. incredibly dangerous tools. And, um, you know, so that's part of what makes the film very special because it has that authenticity and it's not contrived. But um, so you see him in the act, you know, it's an incredibly physical and macho act, the, ch the ice carving, because they're using chainsaws and they're using these really dangerous tools. Um, and yet, on the other hand, it's a really, really delicate and very feminine um, and sort of gentle art form. And so I love that combination of something that's very, very masculine and also very feminine. And then, you know, thematically or in terms of the metaphors, it just connects so much to the story because ice is, as you said, ephemeral and it's fleeting. And it really just sort of speaks to the central metaphors of life and loss and transformation that are part of the story. So, you know, not only did it provide amazing visual possibilities, but it really provided the metaphoric framework for the film. Now, I know that you're in New York City right now. Did you grow up in New York City? I grew up in um, Honolulu, Hawaii, and in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts. Amherst, Massachusetts, it's right down the road from me. I'm in South Hadley. <laughs> oh, okay. wow, so yeah. So, very different Amherst and Hawaii. I've not been to Hawaii, I've been to Amherst. I'm imagining they're very different in a lot of ways, weather-wise, um, as well as culturally, I'm assuming. Um, how did growing up in such different environments affect you, do you think, as a storyteller, as a filmmaker? Well, you know, I'm biracial. I'm, my father is, is Japanese-American, and then my mother is of uh, German-Italian-American ancestry. Wow. And so... Um, and then, you know, my parents split up, and so I, I, I moved from Hawaii to Massachusetts. And so I had this kind of uh, split experience. And I think in terms of being biracial, um, you, you sort of develop a, a consciousness a little bit as an outsider and a little bit as an observer. And I think it, it's also was exa uh, exacerbated or exaggerated or intensified by the fact that my, my parents had separated and lived in very different places and there was that kind of cross-cultural split. Um, so I think I've always been attracted to stories um, where there is some kind of cross-cultural encounter that thematically is something I'm very interested in, like people from very different worlds coming together and, and searching and struggling for some kind of communication, and sometimes it being successful and sometimes it being unsuccessful. Um, that's that's a, a kind of a theme in a lot of my work. And I think in terms of my own perspective, I often exist somewhat on the fringe as an observer and can identify with a lot of different groups, not completely understand or not completely be part of that experience, but feel a lot of identification in different ways and yet would not really belong to any one group. And so my sensibility and kind of consciousness is a little bit on that fringe. And so my work, you know, I think is, is influenced by that. Kimi Takasue, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you. I've really enjoyed it.